discussion called the changing face of African politics. Now I'm just gonna set a bit of the context. As many of you know, the continent has been going through many rapid changes from independence to prosperity leaderships to the recent resignations in Ethiopia and Zimbabwe. And of course, the recent elections we've seen in Liberia, um, also uh, Kenya, <laughs> yes. and um, upcoming in Zimbabwe as well. And of course, uh, we've had a change of leadership in South Africa. So with the backdrop of, of that, and with the continent being the youngest in the world, there have been some new political players that have come into the game, and you're seeing them on the stage right now. And so I'm going to introduce them. We've got Boniface Mwangi from Kenya. Welcome, Thank photojournalist, you. political activist and ran for MP in, uh, in Kenya last year. Yes. Right. Then we have Dr. Koza, right? She's a former MP here in South Africa. Um, she did rattle a, 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 a few things here in the country, and so we'd love to talk to her about that. And we have Eddie Oketch, who is also new into the political game in Kenya, former ALA student and uh, founder of Ongoza, which is a business accelerator. And then we have my fellow Zimbabwean, uh, Dr. Nkosana Moyo, um, who is new, a new political uh, presidential candidate in Zimbabwe, uh, leader of APA, uh, former, uh, used to serve in the government, but is the CEO of Minds. Right. So let us start. First obvious question, has the face of African politics changed at all? Dr. Nkosana, let me start with you. Well, um, the, the face may have changed, but the substance is not changed. Unfortunately, I mean, I think people <coughs> ask this question with Zimbabwe in mind as the latest situation where we had a coup, not coup. Mm. <laughs> and I think that Zimbabweans are going through almost like a euphoric moment, excitement of uh, losing President Mugabe, and often some of them confuse the change of the individual with the change of a system. But when you lose mo look at it closely, the individual has changed, but the system is not changed, same system. And unfortunately, I would argue that the rest of the continent is very similar. We get individuals changing, but the fundamentals are, are the same. And it would be interesting, and I'm not going to try and go ahead of your questions, but it would be interesting to try to understand why is the system not changing? Well, we could ask Dr. Koza about that. She has some very interesting points. You don't believe things have changed. Well, I don't. And, and from a, a gender perspective, um, as we speak right now, there is not a single <coughs> woman head of state in Africa. And um, even if you look at the ruling party in South Africa, the gains that women made since 1994 are being, re are being uh, reversed at an alarming speed. Um, as we speak now, despite the ruling party having a 50-50 policy, if you look at the gender profile of the premiers of the provinces, we have nine provinces in this province, eight of them are under the ANC control. And of those eight provinces, only one is a woman. Seven are all men. And from that perspective, I don't think we have changed. And again, the age profile. Mm. It, it's, it's a really worrying factor that we have a younger population. But in Africa, I'm not sure if we are going to realize our Obama moment <laughs> anytime soon, uh, given the, the approaches that we are using and the kind of system that political parties opt for. So my next question is going to do, be for our two young rebel rousers, right? You have two other people on your panel here that are in their 60s, and I think you are in your late 40s. Mm. <laughs> 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 Should they be running for office as the new face of changing African politics? Um, thanks so much for Be careful, I'm next to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm next to you. <laughs> I, the, the simple answer is yes, okay. uh, and yes because I am a strong believer of integration between the young and the old. The young sometimes brings a lot of talent and energy. The old have, have got the exceptions to the game, as well as um, some experience mm -hmm. that is key in a society. I don't like to see African politics 
as a battle of egos towards a position, but mm -hmm. more the problems we tend to solve. And therefore, as a society, um, just like we need a mother, a father figure, a son in the, in the, in the home, we need this integration. The biggest challenge has been where do we break the balance? So Mugabe at 94 still has a role to play in African politics? He, uh, he, 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 he has a role to play, right? Uh, defining that role is what is important, which is why when you asked about uh, as the face of Africa uh, politics change, I tend to, s uh, I, I don't like to be general. You know, I would, I would like to look at it as it changed institutionally. Mm -hmm. Is there institutional clarity of what is African politics, how is it working, how is it functioning? And to me, uh, more than 10 years ago, we have got um, stronger institutions that I imagine in the African continent, Kenya being an example, constitutionalism has emerged as a strong institution in Kenya, the, the judiciary has emerged as a strong institution in Kenya, um, we do have functioning parliaments as opposed, they might not be the best that we want now, but there has been progress. Number two uh, is the, the, the the balance between the Western influence in our politics vis-a-vis -vis the indigenous voices, has it changed? The answer is yes, it's drastically changing. Uh, my, maybe we haven't reached the balance that we need. Um, and then the, the third would be the gender, right? Uh, we sometimes uh, are attempted to focus on the face of politics being the presidential faces and stuff, but we, we sometimes forget to go lower into representative angles like um, the grassroots representation, parliament. If you look, for instance, in, in Rwanda, it's a common story, over 50% are women. In Kenya, we do have a constitution that says we have to have women representatives in every year, and therefore we've got more women coming to parliament. So there is, there's a shift. And now, the last one being the, the age gap, given that the, the majority of the continent is still um, predominantly youth, uh, I think the average for Kenya is about 19.5 years old, uh, being led by an average of 62% of parliamentarians. Um, that's a problem. And therefore, I, I, I believe that if you start categorize, categorizing what the face of Africa is, you will find that everybody has a role to play. I don't have a problem with somebody like, um, we call him Dr. in Kenya, uh, being an advisory role, putting up an advisory role to imagine young politicians like him and guiding them out, out with, the, with the outside world, there is a place for everyone and therefore we just need to define those. So my question to you is, at what age should people stop running for office, Boniface? I don't think there's a right or wrong age. Every person has a right to have an ambition. Uh, but as a Minds alumni, which Dr. Moore is the founder, I think he can play a bigger role in the continent by training young African leaders. Uh, if you look at Julius Malema and EFF is a product of ANC uh, Youth Wing. Uh, one of the challenges we have as a continent is actually that young people lack political education. And I think people have been there before, someone who's have been in government before, like Dr. Moy should actually be training the next crop of leaders, not being in the same race with them. And I'm saying this because we lack mentorship and motherhood and fatherhood in politics. If you look at the Libyan revolution, Tunisia revolution, and Egyptian revolution, it was led by young people going to the streets uh, of Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. But when it came for the political space, they never got it. Because the only thing that we know to do very well is to demonstrate mm -hmm. and protest. Mm -hmm. But we need to be able to fight for that political space. Because if you're not on the table, you're on the menu. And you need, to <laughs> <laughs> and you need the men on the table, like Dr. Moore, to give us some space to learn the game. So I, I'm, I'm serious. I think for Africa to change, and for our politics to change, we need people who have vied before, willing to step down and say, I'm going to hold your hand and reclaim back Africa from bad leadership. Do you agree, Dr. Koza? Well, I, I do agree. I think succession is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Succession, mentorship, coaching is, are big issues. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, look at uh, in our own country here, we have Nkosa Zanata Minizuma. I'm a generation younger than her. I would have loved to see her coaching and mentoring people like me, mm -hmm. women like me, mm -hmm. but instead she has gone back into politics and that way you have recycled leadership and they are not willing to step out and perform the function that you are talking about of, of being mentors, of being uh, coaches. And I do think that we do need to care about the faces that we have as heads of, head of states. I don't think it's okay not to have women 
as a hate of state. Something is, is fundamentally wrong with the continent when it comes to that. Admittedly, we've made some strides. Um, however, the reality is that whenever we have women as, as, as presidents, it's very easy to remove them or to find a justification of removing them. And I think it does matter because, I mean, statistically speaking, women hold half the sky. And therefore, if we have 100% precedence in Africa, it's not a reflection of the gender balance in our society. So, uh, Dr. Moyo, your panelists have suggested you might play a better role as an advisor, given your age, yet you're running for president in Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> so my no. two questions for you, do you agree, A, and B, what are you going to do about bringing in the gender balance into your party if you were to become president? Okay. You know, this, this conversation is fascinating because this, conver <laughs> this conversation just illustrates how problematic it is for us to get our continent to work because we get the diagnostic wrong. The diagnostic is the most critical part. Why is Africa not working? And we're flailing all over the place trying to isolate what it is that could be driving our non-functioning issue. So tell me something, question. How many popes have not died in office? Catholic Church, how many popes have not died in office? Two. Is the Catholic Church a functioning institution? Yes. No. So. <laughs> They've got a lot of rape. So, so <laughs> I'm just trying to, to illustrate something very simple. So Catholic, pre, uh, Catholic props normally die in office. In fact, I only know one who, who resigned. Who, who, uh, yeah. Catholic, the Catholic Church is functioning. Their leaders normally die in office. So is, is it logical to conclude that Africa is not functioning because of the age of its leaders? Yes, and the mindset. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't, your, <laughs> there is your, a your logic beats me. So let me tell you what I think. Yes. I think that <laughs> the age argument, actually what is behind the age argument is the lack of institutionalization. So it's not age. What this is telling us is that Africa is not institutionalized. It's not age. If we're institutionalized and with functioning institutions, our leaders would die in offices they used to and it would not be an issue. Yeah? That's not to say we shouldn't re-examine as we go along. But when we get the diagnostics wrong, we then come up with the wrong solutions. Young people are also running institutions and countries very badly. Where does that leave us? The, the challenge is institutionalization. So that the role of the individual does not overwhelm the role of the institution. You look at the U.S., the U.S. can be run by somebody who is really useless and still function. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Okay. But, and so, so we have to get the diagnostic right, guys. Yeah? Okay. My second my question, case. how do you bring in more gender equity into so your we, party? We have committed, as a party, we've committed to absolute 50-50 non-negotiable gender balance in the administration. We've also, interestingly, committed to reduce the size of cabinet and uh, remove a category of administrators that is totally useless, deputy ministers. And in its place, in its place, we're going to put junior ministers, precisely for this reason, because innovation and energy come from young people. Mm -hmm. It's completely indisputable. And when a nation deprives itself of the participation of young people, it actually deprives itself of innovation. It, it follows, like day follows night. And the gender balance, as you've argued, how is it that we can deprive ourselves of half of the most important asset on our continent? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It because really of patriarchy. <laughs> Whatever the reason is, you see, I, th I think as a manager. Yes. So forget, I'm not even trying to be gender um, progressive or whatever. No, don't misunderstand. But I think I'm a competent manager. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, if you ask me to run a country and I look at what is any society's biggest resource, it's people. Mm -hmm. So if I take half of them out of the equation, am I being a sensible manager? The answer is no. 
But the problem with, the, with politics, especially on the continent, is that it is stigmatized. And so speak to me about the criminalization of African politics that prevents a lot of us from actually putting ourselves forward. But, but again, you see, these things uh, depend. You have to look for examples where it is clear that when you get the right leader, society can be changed, can be literally reimagined and reconfigured in a very short time. I don't know how many of you know about the history of Tunisia. Bugiba was the president who brought Tunisia to independence. Mm -hmm. Tunisia today is one of, I think, only two Muslim countries where Muslim women, firstly, there is no polygamy in Tunisia. Muslim country, no polygamy. Okay? Secondly, women in Tunisia dress the same way that they will find them dressed in, in New York, in Paris, in, in London. It's a Muslim country. Because there was a leader who understood how to reconfigure his society and make it more progressive. Yes, you're right to identify those things that are blockages to our society moving on. Mm -hmm. But all we need to do is identify what kind of leaders we need mm -hmm. to transform all of that. And this is why you're sitting on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> In spite of my age. You know. <laughs> Eddie. Um, you ran for Senate. You went through some trying times, one might say. Things that would prevent, as I said earlier, young people from entering office. Now, that's you as a man. Imagine as a woman. So speak to us about some of the experiences that you had. And then tell us why we should all go and run for office. <laughs> wow. Um, th th there are so many experiences that I, c I cannot... I cannot uh, say in like in five minutes, I cannot talk about in five minutes, but I think just, I'll just categorize them. I like categorizing so it, it is easier for me to talk about, about them. Just first, first of all, the campaign was uh, a big experience for me uh, because I'd just graduated from Yale University, uh, finished my master's. I had a big responsibility in my institution called Ongoza because I had found some of the most committed people to work with the most, the most passionate people to work with. Um, and we were building an, an institution um, together, uh, which is an, a youth accelerator, a business accelerator in, in Nairobi, out of Nairobi. Uh, <coughs> and and at, at the time that I chose to go into politics, I think what, what triggered it is a number of things, including a mentor who I was working with in the institution. But more importantly, uh, I went home we had adopted a new, a new system called the devolved system, where we have got governors, senators, and then the president, and of course MPs, and members of uh, county assemblies, who are the, the seen, seen as the lowest representation. Um, and with devolution came the resources being taken to the grassroots, and the power being taken to the grassroots. So I'd been out of the country when this entire process was happening, although I was participating, uh, so when I went home after five years, I realized that my county alone was getting 7.6 billion every year. And uh, the governor was apparently corrupting the senator mm -hmm. so, so that uh, they could amass wealth. And, and it, it is very, very clear from how, how rich he had become all of a sudden and how rich the MCS who were along with him were. So I chose to go for the Senate the, because the Senate is articulated in our constitution as, as the... Uh, oversight and accountability function for the governor to avoid the, the corruption. And then very quickly realized that that one, that one did, not, did not sit well with the governor uh, who decided to support another candidate. And with it came a lot of antagon antagonistic efforts and stuff. Um, but my highlight being, and I don't like being dramatic, that one day we organized a rally, got people to come and support us, and my car was shot at. Uh, two bullets, one got the bodyguard of the former governor of, uh, of uh, but the, the current actually is still, is still the governor of, of Mombasa. And the thing is, I was sitting in that car and I saw a bullet pass. I, I have the pictures, I can show you some sometimes later. And, and I remember after that, I stopped the campaign for two weeks and said, no more with politics. And, and there are other experiences, including trying to raise resources. The hardest part was actually trying to mobilize even some of your peers even in the network of ALA to support the cause because politics is not seen as, as the place to go. I, I had a lot of time, first of all, explaining myself to people I was going to uh, uh, politics when I was too young, 
And then number two, just what would you be before you get into politics? You have to have a wife. <coughs> <laughs> you have to have a, a, a house I was staying in a, a, my foster family I, I grew up in foster families about seven of them so I was staying with the last one in their house you have to have a car you have to have a number of things that are fundamental into going into politics but fundamentally you have to belong to the strongest party if you have a chance I was vying in the strongest in the stronghold of ODM for people who know the guy who just uh, got uh, <laughs> He's here as the, as the second yes, president. The of second Kenya. president. <laughs> <laughs> so his party is very strong in my region, and there's no way you have an opportunity. Of course, that, that explains why I'm here as, as, as the person who became second. Mm -hmm. And um, I chose to go as an independent because I, I didn't want to be compromised despite my weaknesses and to focus on my strengths. Mm -hmm. So those, that, those are some of the experiences, but I think that more of them you get to know. Yeah. I want to come to you, Boniface, because he mentioned something about the requirements uh, for being a candidate that's taken seriously and you ran on a very interesting platform where you didn't do what was typical of the other candidates. Please explain what you learned in campaigning for office. Well, I learned many things that uh, poor people don't vote for poor people. <laughs> and why were you considered poor? Because uh, my campaign, so basically when I was going to VI, I decided to actually form a political party with other like many people. The party was called Equality Party, Truth Party. And we came together and we said that we must run on a platform of issues, not tribe. So normally the way African politics work, uh, Mugabe will mobilize Shona's, Zuma will mobilize the Zulus, and then the other tribes are going to follow. And Kenya will have guys mobilizing either Kikuis or Luos, and that's how they define politics. Mm. So you either align yourself with the tribal kingpin, and the party is not defined by policies, it's defined by the tribal kingpin that is in that political party. So we said you're not going to align with any of the two presidents that we have, Rela Odinga or Uhuru Kenyatta, and we formed our own political party. And then I decided that I was going, I'm a poor guy, so I said I'm going to get my campaign funded by the people. And in the history of Kenya, nothing like that has ever happened, that someone comes and begs for votes and money. Mm. And so, so you were the first <laughs> crowdfunding so platform. I, yes, so I, I asked Kenyans to support my campaign. I got over 7,000 people giving me about $140,000, total strangers, so they own my campaign. And then I went knocking doors. I think what, what was very sad for me, I'm going to give you an example, is that I went to Mukuru slums. It's a big shanty slum where they don't have running water, they don't even have toilets. And you go to this very small room, room, it's very poor. The man has three kids, a wife, so it's a family of five. They don't even have toilets. And so they use uh, polythene bags as their bathroom. So you shit in a paper bag, then you throw it out. And you sit down and tell these guys, the room is very dirty, it smells of poverty, it smells of all manner of things. So I'm going to work for you as a member of parliament. I'm going to take a pay cut, I won't have a bodyguard, I lose public hospitals, and I'm going to work for you. And I'll ensure that you have even clean toilets. And the man looks at me. He uses a polythene bag as a bathroom every single day. Mm. And he asked me, what, who are you going to vote for president? And mm. that was the sad thing about our African politics, that it's actually tribal politics. That before they vote for you, they look at your tribe. And I think it's the biggest struggle we have as young Africans is to try and run away from the tribal identity where people are defined by their identity. But I think the biggest lesson for me and what I was able to do for our country is that uh, when I ran for office, I did not win, but I learned. Mm. Is that the map of Kenya was like black and white. Mm -hmm. But by running a very issue-based campaign and a very clean campaign, I was able to color the map of Kenya that whoever comes after me can be able to stand on my platform and actually run their campaign. And secondly, and most importantly, is that you can go into politics with your reputation intact and come out with it intact. Mm. That you went into a very dirty game mm -hmm. and you did not align with your dirty politics. And mm -hmm. you, you did a very, you played a very clean game and came out with a reputation intact. That you can actually, I can actually stand and say, I did not bribe any voter. I did not identify in the, with the tribal political party mm -hmm. and I ran on issues. And in five years' time, the guys are going to run after, uh, uh, after me are going to have an easy job. There's a lady an amazing lady running in Zimbabwe. Uh, how do you say it? Fazai. Fazai. And Fazai is actually has designed her campaign based on what we did in Kenya. Yeah. Our colors, crowdfunding, and all that. So I may not have won the race, sure. but I actually think that we moved the race to, to make it easier to win next time. I'm going to ask Dr. Koza quickly, and then I'll ask you to respond, and then we're going to open it up to the audience to ask some questions. Dr. Koza, you, um, speaking of dirty politics, right, you made waves when you broke away 
and spoke out against the president of your party during a no vote um, situation. <laughs> Please speak to us about that and why. Well, I'm of a very strong view that if we want to change the faces of politics in Africa, we need to um, focus on the moral and, uh, moral and ethical value system of a leader. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and if we look at other countries in the continent where we have failed, primarily it's been because of corruption. Mm -hmm. And um, it was within that context mm -hmm. that I stood up and um, demanded that uh, President Zuma resigns. Mm -hmm. And obviously I faced a lot of backlash from my political party. I was persecuted, my kids were threatened with death even myself, and it got to a point where I had to resign mm -hmm. from the ANC. Mm -hmm. And now I have my own new political party. Mm. Congratulations. <laughs> Dr. Moya. So in terms of uh, this issue of diagnostics, I would like us to, I'm glad that the issue of tribalism has been mentioned. I just mm. want us to dwell on this because I think it's one of, the, not, not the only, mm. but one of the biggest, biggest issues that is holding our continent back. So the first time I heard about uh, something that Samora Machele had said, it, he, uh, he was credited with having said, for the nation to survive, the tribe has to die. Mm. And when I first heard this, I, I doubted whether he really agreed with it. But just now as I'm campaigning, I'm beginning to see the significance of this issue. Mm. So what is, what is Africa's biggest challenge? Africa's two biggest challenges are corruption and nepotism. But what feeds these things? What feeds corruption and nepotism? It's our failure to transform our societies from a tribe into a nation. Yeah? Africa has got no nations. We've got nation states geographically, but we actually have not yet built nations. We still run little tribes within the nation. And the two things happen. So when our leaders emerge and they are like a head of state, when you look at their behavior, they continue to look after a tribe, mm -hmm. not after the nation. Mm -hmm. And what comes from looking after a tribe? Our socialization as Africans is that you look after those who are yours, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. No questions asked. If the two of you come to me looking for a job, and he's my relative and you're not, and he's not qualified and you are, I'll still give you the job, yeah? Mm. You, you look after your own, but what follows immediately from that is that performance management is not possible. Performance management is not possible because when you give a job to your wife, your child, daughter or son, when they fail to perform, what do you do? When they are corrupt, what do you do? These are the, this is the poison. That is what's just destroying us. So we need to understand, it's not age. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with age. <laughs> 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 Says our wise elder. <laughs> but until, until we resolve the, this issue of how do we transform our tribal thinking into understanding that when you are head of state, the whole nation is your tribe. Mm. The whole nation is your tribe. Yeah? Until we get to that point, we aren't started yet. That's, that's my opinion. Does anybody have anything else to say before we open it up to the, to the audience? I actually concur with him. One of the reasons why I was so much persecuted in Guazulu Natal mm -hmm. is because I was coming from Guazulu Natal and President Jacob Zuma was also a Zulu. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was therefore seen as somebody that was destroyed. Disloyal. Mm -hmm. the disloyal, disloyal to the yeah. tribe. Mm. And, um, and I think the reason why it, I was also persecuted there because the whole disciplinary process took place in Guazulu Natal was precisely because I was seen as a delinquent. But talk to us about this collective stupidity that people have when they fall in line <laughs> to just <laughs> appease uh, the party line. Well, uh, to be honest, one of the things about that is said about liberation movement politics is that we all bought into this, uh, um, what do you call it, the Lenin's model of decision-making processes. Yeah. 
uh, democratic centralism. And, and democratic centralism, you know, is premised on the fact that once the, 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 the upper structure has taken a decision, everyone else below that has to abide by that decision. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have a decision taken by that upper structure, that is stupid, frankly. You, you, you are forced to, to become part of this collective stupidity, you know, because you are now forced, even if you disagree with that. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to break ranks with the leadership of the ANC, although I was at a level that is lower than them, because I did not want to be part of that collective stupidity. <laughs> we have a lot I of questions. <laughs> Does somebody want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I just, okay. Just, just that. Wait, who's speaking? It was a I, 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 oh, I, I sorry. want to put something ahead. on the tribe thing, but. Let's just, just let's, let's open it up. Um, please, when you get the microphone, uh, state who you are, your company organization, and then ask your question directed to one of the panelists. Thank you. And try to be equitable, please. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Flower Kaliza. I'm a second year student from Rwanda. And it was mentioned, um, you mentioned um, the idea of not having strong institutions on the continent. And I just wanted to ask, what do you think we can do to like solve that? Because what happens is, it's either you have no functioning institutions, or you have this, I'll call them authoritarian leaders, who are the institutions of the nation. So a country is functional, but they are the judiciary, they are the electoral body, um, they're everything. They, without them, the country isn't functional. So how do we strike a balance? How do we move away from someone being our systems, our institutions, and move to a system of accountability where if you leave and you've done so much and you have this amazing legacy, it's not lost because you have left. Um, yeah, that's my question. Okay, uh, let's take uh, two more questions and then we'll have the panelists answer. I'm Dumiso Mkandla from Zimbabwe. Yes, Mkandla, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, just two issues. Firstly, you spoke about the issue of um, the politics where people campaign but with fear. I, I, I want to know how we can encounter this politics of fear. You would never campaign in Zimbabwe and say Robert Mugabe is old, and yet mm. he's old. Mm -hmm. You'd go to jail mm -hmm. just for that. And then the other issue is, is there a possible link between our kingdoms going back into history versus the westernization of leadership in Africa? Mm. Looking at the kind of way we are doing things, I said it, therefore it is correct. This is for everybody. Is this a question for everybody? Okay. Uh, last question. Sorry, that person behind you had their hand up. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Sure. My, my name is Cyril Mishino. I'm from Kenya. I'm a second year here at African Leadership Academy. And I have two questions. So first question is just, first of all, to say that age is not necessary. I, I'm a strong supporter of changing people time and again, getting new energy. But I like uh, the, the words that Nkosana, uh, Nkosa, Nkosana said that age is not necessary and you have a problem right now, which is tribe. I'm Kenyan, I'm Luo and Kikuyu, the two tribes that are on different forefronts. And every time I go back to my tribal land, it's always like you thief of the votes when I go to the Luo side and it's a different thing the Kikuyu side. How can you address this problem? Because Boniface and Eddie here tried to run elections that are fueled in terms of uh, uh, the issues, but we didn't see people respond very well. I supported Boniface himself. I sent 500 shillings, but still. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. I think I think you need to give him a book. You need but, to but, give him a but still, Starehe members <laughs> didn't vote for Boniface, despite him having a very issue-based campaign. They ended up voting for Jaguar, who was just given an endorsement by the president. No issue tied last minute. Then uh, my second question is a question that I really want all of us to focus on. We're really trying to look at more women in leadership. I, I think that affirmative action thing is something you're trying to implement. Rwanda's doing very well, and Kenya implemented affirmative action to get more women in leadership. But the question is, what effect is it having? Good example in Kenya is we had an MP, run, uh, someone running for parliament in uh, the Samburu region. She's called Naisula. 
And people, whenever she was running for that, would tell her, why don't you go for that seat of you as woman representative and leave this for the men here in the society? Oh. So what effect is this affirmative action having in our society? And she said that time and again whenever she had interviews. Can we make sure that affirmative action is being used in the right way and that it's not uh, being used by people in the society yeah. to bring down women further? Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. All right. Yeah, uh, we're going to have them answer this first, then we'll get back to the questions of the audience. And I need to see more hands come up on this side. But this is after they, 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 they answer questions. So, audience, um, panel members, please. Who wants to answer, answer the first question? Well, regarding institutions, I think we have a very, very good example of South Africa. Um, in South Africa, we've actually made sure that it's in the constitution that the president cannot run for more than two terms. And secondly, we have the office of the public protector, which is in the constitution. And the judiciary, even the way the, 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 constitution, the South African constitution is crafted, is such that it's almost impossible to have a, a, a judiciary that is so compromised. Hence, we have seen a situation where even uh, when the president would be taking the matters to court, the judiciary will be taking a decision based on the materiality of facts as opposed to who is, as opposed to the position that the person holds. So I'm saying when it comes to institutions, we are a living example of that. And the only reason why I'm also able to go back into politics is because the constitution is actually allowing us to do so. Um, on the question that you've asked to say about gender, um, gender versus quality, I would like to frame it that way. I really do not believe that when we are trying to affirm women in the process we vulgarize gender equality. Because if we are going to take a woman that is not capable and you put that woman in that position, you are actually vulgarizing gender. And it's important that that gender equality must, must not compromise quality, substance, and the value that the person is going to add. Thank you, thank you. Who wants to respond? Okay, uh, let, let me try. Which question these are you are, These are not, uh, well, I, I will take the one of institutionalization. Okay. okay. I, think, I think the challenge for our continent on institutionalizing is a bit of a historical issue. So for most of us, I know it's a generalization, for most of our nations, we came through some kind of struggle. We fought against somebody to get where we are. During that exercise, it was necessary to try and get as much uniformity in behavior as possible. In other words, there is no contestation in the struggle. You all unified and so on. What that has led to is that we are not very good at accommodating contestation. I think contestation is a necessary condition for institutionalization and for challenge in a manner where the challenge does not then get interpreted as disloyalty. Yeah? So we somehow need to move on from fighting a struggle where there was need for absolute cohesion and the no spies, the no dissenting, and so on and so on, to a space where now all of us are on the same side, but for all of us to keep each other on our toes, we need to allow and accommodate contestation mm -hmm. and understand how to manage diversity. Without contestation, it is not possible to build institutions that are living institutions that can evolve where there is no deliberate sometimes, but often I think misguided, where if you disagree, you are considered as being disloyal, not only to a party, but you are considered disloyal to the nation. Mm. You are a sellout. Yeah. Yeah? It, it's these levels that get used, which then kill our ability to manage diversity and they keep our institutions true to what they were meant for. Because if you all agree, you're going to lead your, you're going to destroy your institutions, sure. yeah? That's what, what, what we experience. Boniface, you have something to say? So and then we need, uh, just so you know, the next few questions, we need to wrap it up quickly. So panelists, please answer as fast as possible. Okay, so about tribalism, I think uh, the biggest reason why we have tribalism is that young people have decided to follow their parents' advice. 
So your average Kenyan doesn't speak their vernacular, but they vote according to the tribe or their last name. And that needs to stop. The other thing is that young people must be very selfish about their future. Because when you're selfish about your future, you protect it. And you do it right, right now. So if tribalism is destroying our countries, then you stop voting tribally. And when it comes to women in leadership, I think men must protect women. Every person in this world is born of a woman. And we must actually fight patriarchy. And the men must lead because the men are the big, biggest species of patriarchy. And so for us to reclaim back our continent, as Franz Fanon says, is that uh, every generation must discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. So it's actually now it's our time. We're the majority. We must become selfish and actually fight tribalism and fight patriarchy and reclaim back our respective countries. And let me tell you one thing. We are all young and we have lots of energy. And if you don't do something right now, one day, because most of us don't have kids, like the younger guys, you're going to become a parent. And they're going to, your son or daughter is going to ask you, daddy or mommy, what did you do when these things were happening? So before our continent is destroyed by the Chinese, by imperialism, by tribalism, and by corruption, we must stand up now because our forefathers fought colonization. So we have a responsibility to actually fight today's challenges and be willing to pay the price. I think you're too comfortable with social media, uh, English Premier League, betting, and many other things to take charge. But remember this, Biko, Lumumba, Sankara, Malcolm X, Martin Luther, all the freedom fighters were young people. So this is our time to do it. And that is the reason why I don't think it's in concern we should be leading the battle to reclaim back our countries. You should be in the ranks as an advisor, as an elder, even as a presidential candidate. But the people leading the infantry, the people who are in the trenches should be young people. So you must stand up and be counted and stop whining and complaining. It's not the work of Mohammed, Jesus, Obama to save our countries. It is our responsibility. Eddie, before we go to the next question. So for, for, for me, I want to just to, to stress on something very important that uh, has informed my path to where I am right now. You know, there are wishes, and everybody has got a dream. I believe that everybody in this, in this room matters. Everybody in this place has a dream, a zeal to want to excel, and a zeal to want to exist with other people. But also there are some critical realities that despite all these issues that we're talking about, if some fundamentals are not found right, there is going to be a problem. And to me, the one that I've been, always been biased towards is the economic issue. This is why I see politics ab as about our people or land, and uh, therefore politics cannot exist in, uh, in isolation from the economics, and that would mean the businesses as well as um, the, the civil society. The reason why I say this is because of the issue of tribe I wanted to respond to earlier. Um, and I'm going to be very fast. My, I, I, I was, I was uh, born in a Luo zone, and then I grew up in the street a little bit, got adopted by a Kikuyu, uh, and the Kikuyu took me to school. When the violence started, and when I came back from high school, it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I had to go to court, change my name, to start a peace activism um, called Ongoza, which is uh, what we're referring to uh, earlier. And then when I was doing the peace activism, I realized very quickly that despite where you came from, from which tribe and who you were supporting, there were critical mass of politicians who were giving young people handouts so that they can participate in politics, be it to go to the streets, be it to go to their rallies, be it to target a member of another, another tribe. And, and, and to me, that became like the anchor for my activism. That as a young person, regardless of which, which tribe I'm coming from, if I don't have economic empowerment, I am a tool for hire for anyone. Right? Uh, so the age factor that we're talking about is like a, it's like a gun and a, and a bullet. Right? We are bullets, but we are harmless without guns. And to me, we can only be harm, uh, harmful to, to, to poverty in the continent. We can only be harmful uh, to this disorganization in the continent if we are, we are given the guns, and which to me is, 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 is resources. One first Mwangi rain um, in Starehe, among, uh, he, was, he was poor and he was raising money from, from people in time that he could have spent with the constituents to explain what, he was, what, what, what his vision was, right? When other people 
the, including minor commander and the other old guards, had the money which was not distributed. Probably if today a young person was to, to buy a Guinness Dactari here, that I would have more wealth and more time to go around, mm -hmm. the young person would try to get a lot of wealth. So uh, out of politics, in terms of what you could do, if you find initiatives, such as Ongoza, my organization, sorry for being selfish, but <laughs> other organizations as well that are doing work that can be able to improve the livelihood of young women and men who have got the zeal to want to succeed, try to increase their income, and they will find the strength to participate in politics. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got three more questions and we have to run it up. I've already chosen them. This one, you back there, and Irene. Let's go. Please, quick questions, guys. And uh, panelists, wrap it up. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Olympios Raptis. I work in the European Parliament. I'm Greek by origin. Assume a, a practical question. Assume that I have some money to invest in one of the countries in which you're studying as politicians. Let's say that I want to set up a Greek restaurant. So I will employ some local people. I will set up a logistic chain. What arguments would you bring to convince me that your country is the one that I would not have to bribe a politician? I assume that you hold power you know, assume that you know you become you know the finance minister or the judicial minister or the president or, or, the, or the prime minister. What argument? What reforms would you pass to make sure that if I have a litigation, you know, with a with a competitor, then the judicial system will treat us both fairly, impartially, not in a tribal matter? What uh, assurances do I have that uh, if I want to set shop, I can do it quickly? The licensing authorities they will not request. Uh, to be bribed, and what reassurances do I have that uh, if I want to close it because the business doesn't do well, I can do it easily? Okay, first question back here. Yeah. Sorry. And then Irene. Quick questions, please. Hello, uh, my name is Said Zarouk. I'm from Tunisia and I'm currently a politician at the African Leadership Academy. Mm. My main question is. 20 years ago, this guy called Fred Zakaré wrote an article called The Illiberal Democracy, mm -hmm. right? It was prophetic in the sense that he talked about how we're going towards this democratic change, yet leaders all over the world are rigging elections, taking advantage of political institutions, and basically making their democracies illiberal. So my question to you is, in relation to Paul Kagame's Rwanda, Bourguiba's Tunisia, um, various Kwan Lee's Singapore, would you rather want a liberal autocracy that functions well or an illiberal democracy that undermines human rights yet undergoes a democratic process? Interesting. And Irene, last question. Quick answers, panelists, please. Uh, thank you, Vimbai. Uh, two very quick ones. Uh, the first one is to Boniface. Um, what do you think is the main difference between African democracy and Western democracy? Because I think the problem with us as a continent is we have this copy and paste kind of method, um, and that's why a lot of things don't work out for us. So I'd like to hear from you. Then to Dr. Moyo, um, as a Zimbabwean, um, I have not heard much about you, um, and there's a lot of, I guess, uncertainty about the upcoming elections because we don't know much about presidential candidates. So I'm curious to know how you've been engaging Zimbabweans as a candidate. Thank you. So I start. Um, so the last question, I think, uh, the difference between Western and African democracy is that uh, when you have someone in power, uh, instead of institutions being very strong, they're submissive to the person. So you find that as the president, he can undermine the courts, he can undermine the, the police, he can undermine any arm of government that actually does not agree with that person. So from Kagame to uh, Museveni to uh, Magufuli, Pombe, and even to Huru Kenyatta. They've been trying to do that. I think one thing about very commendable South Africa is actually that even if Zuma tried, the ANC was able to do that together with the institutions. So Africa, let me say this, and I don't think, and I'm going to say this very loosely, so don't stone me. I don't think is that white people are inherently good people. They're not. They brought colonization, they brutalized, they raped our country. They're not good people. But because they're very bad and they used to be very bad people, they came up with very strong institutions to protect them from each other. So Americans, the founders of America, were slave keepers and guys who used to raid and renegades. 
Then they realize they are dangerous to each other. What did they do? They came up with very strong institutions. And that's the reason why your average American or British or whoever it is will not jump at traffic lights. Because they know very well if they get caught, it's going to hit their pocket, their pocket, then they lose the license. Then they become useless, they can't even work. So the idea is, same thing that needs to apply in Africa. You have strong institutions. We must stop relying on people's goodwill. It's not good enough. That doesn't work. I don't care if you're Muslim, Christian, white, black, yellow, doesn't matter. Have strong institutions to a level where it is that even if you get a president as damn evil rapist like Trump, the country still goes on. So yes, Trump is very evil to the world. He's racist. We know that. But because of strong institutions, he's going to get into trouble soon. Uh, Robert Mueller is doing his work, so eventually he'll get caught. And that's what happened to Zuma as well. So let us stop investing on people. Let us invest in institutions, and it'll be good. Okay. Who wants to answer the next question? Um, yeah, okay. So, quick one. You are Zimbabwean. I come, I've been brought up in the private sector, and what I understand is that if I own a company, I firstly figure out what kind of job I want done, and then I don't wait for people to come to me, I go out to look for them, in terms of who I want to run my company. What disappoints me, especially a question like that, I'm sorry I'm going to be quite personal to you as well. What disappoints me today in my campaign about Zimbabweans is that young Zimbabweans will ask me a question like this. What are you doing to engage people? What are you doing to get the right leader for your country? What are you investing anything, any energy to research, to find out who should lead your country today? Or are you waiting for somebody to just come and sell themselves to you? It doesn't happen in the private sector. The owner of the company looks for the leader, not the other way. But we, in terms of we collectively, sorry, let me be inclusive. We wait for people to come and convince us that they are the right leader, as opposed to us look, going to look for them and say, at this point in the evolution of my country, I believe you are the person who should lead it. And the young people in particular, your numbers give you the upper hand. There is no African election that young people, the outcome of which young people cannot determine, not one. So both the quality and the outcome of the election is entirely dependent on what young people choose to do or not to do. Okay. So instead of asking me what I'm doing, I think the question should be, what are you as a young person doing to try and identify the right leader for your country to co-create with you a future that's going to work for you? So that's that one, okay? Uh -huh. Now, the, the, there is a question about economy and the democracy and institutionalization. Again, we need to be quite uh, systematic in terms of our thinking. Institutions are built by people. There is no single country anywhere in the world where the institutions just came to be out of the blue. So you have to find people who then steer institutions into maturity. Go to the US, that's why they always talk about the founding fathers. They are the people who figured out what institutions were required and nurtured them into maturity. If you go all over Europe, this issue of democracy and economy, there is no country, as far as I'm aware, where democracy preceded economic development. Because economic development gives you the freedom to resist what the politicians try to do to you. Mm -hmm. If you are beholden to them economically, you do what they want, you do their bidding, and what we experience in Africa at the moment is collusion between the private, so-called private sector and the dispensers of patronage. Yeah. That's what we see. Mm -hmm. So until our economies allow the citizenry to resist because they are independent, they don't depend on these contracts from politicians, we are always going to have a... So again, let's be clear, let's look at history and understand. The question from the uh, European Parliament gentlemen. You know, my view is that one of the problems, you guys are causing us a problem. Because you are asking us to focus on FDI. Actually, that is wrong. We should build our institutions for ourselves first. Yeah? So, when I'm building Zimbabwe, what I'm going to be saying to myself is, 
what are the right institutions for Zimbabweans to thrive? If I do that right, FDI will automatically be accommodated. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So that's the way I'll do it. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have anything to say to wrap things up? It would be good. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, wait, we didn't answer his question. About our Tunisian brother. Yes. Autocracy. Uh, yes. And I don't think there is room for autocracy at this time and age. It's not possible. Uh, if you look at autocrat autocratic regime like uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, it was actually an autocratic democracy. Uh, when they collapse, the country goes down. And the same thing, the same thing is going to happen to governments Rwanda. So democracy any day, and liberal democracy for that matter. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I wish I could have wrapped this up nicely, but um, we're s sadly out of time. Uh, we have something for our uh, panelists before you go. Uh, please come up. Thank you so much. Yeah, but you know what? We have to talk to young people. <laughs> this, um, this panel needed to be much longer. Just wait, 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 wait a second, uh, ladies and gentlemen. All right, um, as an African Leadership Academy, we'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to share your insights on politics and how we can change the political game. And we thank you for coming to share our Desenio with us. And these are just small tokens of appreciation that we have for all of you. Thank, thank you. you. And we clearly needed more time. We clearly needed more time. Thank you. Oh, that's very nice.